Welcome to uh, the RAI Women in Architecture Celebration and to this series of one-on-one -on -one conversations with Irish women architects working around the globe. Unfortunately, we can't be all together this year for our celebration, which we normally held, hold in 8 Marion Square. But um, through Zoom, we're reconnecting with our, our friends and colleagues around the world and listening to their stories at this time. Today, I'm speaking to Jennifer O'Donnell, um, whose practice is called Plattenbau Studio and is based in Berlin. Um, so Jennifer is going to talk to us about what life is like in Berlin and um, what brought her there and uh, just generally talk about the practice of architecture from her perspective. So welcome, Jennifer. Thank you, Carol. I'm really delighted to be, uh, to be virtually, uh, virtually here um, at this event. It's also something that's uh, very important to me to, um, to empower women in architecture. So um, uh, thank you for having me on board. Mm -hmm. um, I guess to explain a little bit about myself um, to begin with, uh, I'm an Irish architect. I studied at UCD. Um, I did my Bachelor of Science and my Bachelor of Architecture there eventually, also my diploma in professional practice. Um, and uh, I worked uh, as an architect then at home in Dublin for two years uh, upon graduating. I worked for GKMP Architects. Uh, after which I moved to Berlin uh, together with my partner and we um, spent three years working for Sarah Burkutten Architects here who would be a big firm in the city um, and uh, following that uh, I set up my own practice together with Jonathan my partner in January 2018 and since then we've been uh, building up the practice so that's a, that's a shorthand version of my CV. Okay, very good. And tell me, do you, do you work in, how do you get work in Germany? Like, or mm -hmm. I think you're still doing some work in Ireland. Is that correct? Do you balance the two? Yeah. yeah, we, we very much, um, we work in both contexts. So we, um, when we moved to Germany, we kind of disappeared, uh, from the Irish scene for a little while. Um, so we were working so hard. And then when we set up the practice, that Irish network, uh, uh, activated again, which was amazing. Um, and it, it very much uh, has a lot to do with actually the architects that we know um, at home. People always say that uh, architects don't help each other out with jobs and that kind of thing, but we've actually found the opposite to be true, that the beginning of our practice was very much supported um, by, uh, by our network at home and our network here. And our mm -hmm. network here uh, comes from those years again at Sarah Burkutten, where we, uh, we, I mean, it's a big office between 90 and 130 people um and we um got our kind of social network from there a lot of very good friends um and then also our architectural contacts uh and contacts sorry so um yeah projects at the end of the day is what that means yeah so so you 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 collaborate with other architects do you or do they just pass work on to you and you work independently um a mixture of everything we collaborate on almost everything that we do uh, again, that goes back to a lot of the friends we had at Sarah Burkutten now also have their own practices, so we uh, collaborate with them um, from everything we're about to hand in, the planning application today for a house um, done together with a friend uh, from Sarah Burkutten and, um, uh, and other projects as well, drawing projects that we, um, that we would do uh, in Ireland and abroad. So um, it's a little bit people coming to us, as you know, saying, um, would you be up for doing this job? Uh, mm -hmm. And then uh, a lot of banding together with friends to have the, the power or the numbers to, to bid for bigger work. Okay. And I know that you, your, your practice and, and certainly uh, you and I presume Jonathan as well produce some beautiful drawings. So there's kind of an art practice maybe side to what you do, is there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, um, it's a funny thing to, uh, uh, to label ourselves as, I guess, we, I mean, we don't, we don't consider ourselves as artists and yet there are drawings that we do that aren't um, produced for the purposes of making a building. So it's a question of what do we call those things? Um, uh, we've found ourselves um, in art contexts quite a lot. We were really lucky to have a, a be part of a group show at IMA last year called A Vague Anxiety. Um, and they're a good friend, um, advised us or um, made the point beforehand of remember you're architects in an art context, you're not artists in an art context. And that really uh, helped actually because it reminds us that we have something to say as architects that is valid in that context 
in that forum that's different to the things that artists have to say. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a bit of a segue, I guess, but um, it's, it is an inherent part of our practice in that we, we like most people, got an opportunity to, to, um, to do something. So we jumped from our, from our full-time jobs the opportunity fell through which also happens quite a lot and then we were sitting there going what do we do now and drawings were something that we had loved when we were in university and we continued um to make for exhibitions like the describing architecture event mm -hmm. uh, which used to be held annually which is an amazing uh, opportunity to just make a piece of work um and uh, and we loved doing that so we said right well let's just start making some drawings again and see if if there's a validity to the idea of a practice that also makes drawings as something of value in and of themselves. Um, and that grew uh, very quickly actually to be a almost 50% of the work that we do are actually drawing commissions. Mm -hmm. um, so that's from private people, that's from public bodies, that's for exhibitions, that's through, uh, through funding some of the time, um, oh, but that's all great. drawings. Yeah, and would these drawings be very architectural in terms of like they'd be measured drawings? They, yes. Yes, mm -hmm. as opposed to the, you know, more kind of free-flowing perspective. Than that. Yeah. Exactly. The drawings always do, they, uh, we don't make the nicest drawings in the world, um, but uh, they have to have a purpose. Um, and the purpose is usually to either um, transmit information or uh, to others or um, as a tool for communicating with others. So as a, a, a base for starting a discussion um, uh, where you might, for example, ask people to draw what they're thinking um, onto a drawing and that opens up another way of, of, um, of talking about something with people. So, um, and what materials do you use? I mean, do you use uh, AutoCAD, do you use technology or do you use watercolor or do you use a mixture? They're all digital drawings. So we we um, we came from the um, tradition of hand drawing at UCD. I learned to use a computer in fourth year uh, mm -hmm. when I was in uh, on Erasmus in Stockholm. They all looked at me like I was mad because I was going around trying to make T squares from bits of timber. But um, they uh, so we we came from this tradition of hand drawing at that school and also a. a a strong appreciation for drawing actually and um, that we didn't want to lose so it took us a while to get our flow into like how could we transmit that into digital drawing and um, and I guess part of the way we do that is actually a lot of the time through um, through um, digital drawing so uh, working with a tablet basically and um, so we we draw digitally as if we were drawing by hand we have this kind of pet age in the office of CAD blocks and things like that. Yes, um, oh, I do too. <laughs> yeah. And I don't use AutoCAD. I'm a, I'm a dinosaur. But I, I just, I see it in college with my students. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sorry, I, I, I digress there. So I'm always at the RHA um, annual exhibition. I don't know if you're familiar with it or not. Yes. Probably yeah. are. I always am um, very interested in the architectural exhibit, exhibit of that because there always seems to be quite a lot of people crowding around to have a look. I think people are intrigued by mm -hmm. architectural drawing and architect, architectural models. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, do you think there's more room for us as a profession to showcase our work through that platform? I think definitely. I, I really do. I think we, I mean, when we're in university, we don't get to build projects most of the time, right? We learn how to represent ideas, actually. We learn how to represent projects that most of the time never get built. Uh, so we have five years of training there in, that, in how to make things, how to draw things, how to communicate. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's a fundamental thing, part of what we do. And I think we don't, we don't sell it enough, actually, mm -hmm. as part of what we do. Um, and because of that, and because of the 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 pressure on everyday practice um, to produce drawings for you know for building, which we all know and which we have to do, which is an important part of the practice, uh, that other side of things, that representation side of things, falls to the wayside. And I think we don't get the time to develop uh, those skills that we spent our university days developing further. Actually, I always say to my students that you um, you have five years to learn how to uh, how to design, how to draw, how to model, how to find your own language for these things. Because once you're in office uh, land, um, that's not the priority anymore. Yeah. 
So, so that brings us around to your teaching practice. In your teaching at the Technical University in Branch Five, mm -hmm. and so maybe tell us a little bit about that and and how how maybe it differs from what you experienced at UCD. Sure. I mean, I so I I taught at UCD briefly for a year um, before I moved over here. I taught in first year. Um, and then I, I taught um, at the TU Berlin briefly and now um, for the last two years I've um, uh, been a teaching assistant at uh, the Institute for Design and Architectural Strategies at uh, TU Braunschweig. So that's um, in Irish terms, I'm a studio tutor. Uh, I, run, I run design projects and um, I mean the fundamentals are the same. Uh, definitely it is... Um, uh, hmm. It, the Irish context is a is a different one, I guess, because it is, it's a small country. It's uh, the architectural education is very much grounded in its context. Uh, there's a small pool of of architects still feeding into um, the studio cultures, which isn't. A, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. um, you come to the Theo Braunschweig or to German University in general, which uh, has very long traditions. Of, of teaching and they're very much uh, uh, practice orientated actually, they're business orientated. Um, uh, so it's a little bit different in that sense. They um, put more onus on the student being um, ready for the profession at the moment they walk out the door, um, as opposed to maybe focusing a little bit more on developing uh, the student's abilities as a designer um, with the knowledge that there'll be a, um, the years of kind of um, practice-based study afterwards, if that makes well, sense. Well, in some ways, that's the opposite of really of what the schools of architecture do here. I often hear mm -hmm. graduates from the schools of architecture lament the fact that they don't know enough about practice mm -hmm. and the qualities of practice. You know, they've only been taught how to design. Do you think that one is better than the other, or yeah? I think it's a balance that's extremely difficult to get right. I, I. I do think uh, we are by and large unprepared for the real world when we come out of univers university and we think of ourselves half as artists. Um, in my case, I don't think that was a bad thing because the, it led to me having confidence, the confidence to do the drawing side of my practice, which I really want to do and I'm glad that I do. And mm -hmm. I think I do it because of that education that I had in the way that I had it. Mm -hmm. uh, um, Nonetheless, there's this massive learning curve that you have to uh, catch up on when you go into practice about, okay, how do I be a professional? I mean, for me, the diploma in professional practice was actually the thing that um, that really um, yeah, taught me those things. It was a kind of a crash course. And obviously working for a small practice as I was at the time where I was involved in the everyday. But the, the danger, of course, of putting too much onus on learning the business side of things in, in college is that those those finite few years of learning how to design get um, get chopped down even further. Yeah. So it's very complicated, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I don't I don't know if there is a right or a wrong way. I think, yeah, yeah. There's, there's, you, you, you've explained it quite well there. So tell us about life in Berlin. Is it better than life in Dublin or maybe? <laughs> <laughs> it's a dangerous question, but the easy answer, yes. <laughs> in ways of course um i mean uh we we miss home very much uh all the time and it is uh it's a different life but um it's a far higher quality of life over here actually um we um are i mean with like being a student in dublin anyone who's been a student in dublin is used to living in uh, substandard accommodation and being cold and broke and poor and all that kind of thing and we didn't really graduate too far from that uh, that circumstance when we were uh, working in Dublin just because of, of how expensive Dublin is, um, which is it talk, which talks speaks to the quality of life that you can have there. And um, and so over here, um, all of those things are just kind of not uh, not a problem anymore, I guess, in the same way. Um, and there are things that I really value that I have an apartment that's warm and dry and it's not tiny um, and uh, and I have social protections and those kind of things but the main the main thing that we love about here is actually the life of the city itself we still are fascinated by the place every day there's just so much to learn um, they like the Berliners I guess because they were left alone in the city for a long time while people didn't really care about what was happening here learned um, to 
to take ownership over their city. Uh, they really understand the idea of civic right to the city. They fight really hard against things that might in the long run not be good for the city. Um, and so that's really, really changed uh, the way we think about things, um, uh, about the things that we should be fighting for actually um, in our public realm and in our cities. Um, so there's all of that. There's also, I mean, one of the fundamental reasons we moved to Berlin was the was the opportunities that we hoped would present themselves to us here that might not present themselves to us at home. We always knew that we might want to set up our own practice. And we also knew that doing so in, in Ireland would likely mean um, fighting long and hard to get out of house extensions and, and small work that we'd be limited to over there. Whereas uh, we're not limited to that here. There's a far larger range of work that we can do. Um, it means we have to be kind of chameleons and jump from one thing to another all the time, but um, I'm grateful to be able to do that. Um, mm. And how how is that how does that happen? Is there is there more trust in younger architects? I, I don't know where. Like, is that a problem, or is there more architectural competitions, or is there just generally more small work and fewer architects looking for it? How how do you get that better spread? No, I did. I mean, there are too many architects in Berlin. There's there are three thousand registered architects in the Berlin Chamber of Architects. Um, uh, and um, because of the um, because Berliners also grew up doing everything themselves, they also uh, do a lot of stuff themselves. They don't really need architects as much. Like things like house extensions or um, uh, apartment renovations and things don't actually uh, come to the table as much because people are doing all of that themselves. They're kind of empowered to do that, which I also find kind of cool. But um, uh, there is definitely trust in in young architects over here or interest i think it because it's a young city and it's it's very vibrant and creative and um uh, i mean it's in itself not maybe a good thing but there's this idea of youth as something that's uh, that's um cool and sellable and that's being very pessimistic about it but basically uh, they don't um, different or they don't discriminate against young people because they're uh, young it's actually the opposite okay that's that's really interesting and what about architectural competitions do you enter competitions or do you have how, how do you feel about architectural competitions yeah it, it's an interesting one we um we enter architectural competitions most of the time only when we're invited or when we come on to a team that's collaborating with other architects we generally tend to not invest uh, time and resources into a shot in the dark uh, if we're going to do that we'll actually do a research project we'll survey something or we'll draw something or we'll we'll make something that um where we set the brief um when we do do competitions like i said it's a lot of the time about uh, collaborating um so i mean the very first job that we had um when we started the practice was uh to do the future campus competition as part of O'Donnell and Toomey's team um, mm. um, for the School of Creative Arts or the Creative Design Building, whatever it's called now. Um, and uh, so that was uh, that was amazing. That was O'Donnell and Toomey leading the team. Uh, us and another young practice friends of ours called Superposition, um, who are Hong Kong, Sligo based, um, uh, who we worked together with. Um, we actually, O'Donnell and Toomey brought us on board separately um, uh, to design separate parts of, um, of the campus and we um, chose to actually um, combine and work together, um, which was a fantastic way to also find our feet because you're, you know, you're drowning in these huge projects at the beginning as a young practice. There's so much to, to take in and consider and so having another young practice as an anchor was, uh, was amazing. Yeah. Um, and uh, and kind of gave us confidence in the process of collaborating. Um, because uh, I think there's collaborations that work and there's collaborations that don't. I think when they work, it's because you're good at one thing, someone else is good at something else, and you're actually uh, taking the brunt of the thing that you're good at from them. So they have the ability to, to focus on the thing that they're good at. I think what doesn't work is when you have uh, people who are fantastic at the same thing merging to try and make an even better thing it, it yeah. just 
the results in. Yeah, so it's kind of it's down to kind of designating scope of services to the various parties that are collaborating. And then in terms of fees, do you feel that you have become more confident in knowing how to charge for your work now? Was that a problem when you were at the early stages? Uh, I'll be totally honest. We were bit, we were disastrous at it. We really we uh, we were so bad at valuing our work. Um, there was almost a fear there that uh, if we like if we charge properly and we got something wrong, then uh, or it's better to to undercharge and then we're somehow uh, more safe or something from consequence. Like ridiculous things that that are the result of an arts education where the onus isn't put on you also have to be a business person. Yeah. So that for us, that's a, that is still a, a hard learning curve that we're on mm-hmm. is how to value ourselves, how to understand that, that you shouldn't ever work for free. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, that your time is valuable um, and, and that you have years and years of experience in, in education behind you. Mm-hmm. Even if you're in your early thirties, it doesn't matter. You still, um, you're still a professional and, mm-hmm. That yeah no that is taking a, a long time to to uh, get hammered home with us if I'm perfectly honest it's a, it's a hard you, learning curve again do you think there's a difference between Germany and Ireland in that regard do you think architects are valued more in Berlin than they were in Dublin they are yeah definitely uh, for two reasons one we have the uh, ha H O A I in said in English the How I E, uh, which is the honorare for architects and engineers, um, which is our fee scale. It's um, it's fairly simple. We our fees are regulated. Um, we don't uh, we don't compete with each other for the fees. There is a, a sliding scale of three different levels um, of. Uh, difficulty to the work and then there's another sliding scale of your how you value yourself as an architect whether you're in grade one two or th- three mm-hmm. um, and that's it uh, so that helped <laughs> because the decision was taken away from us actually there was a it was the chamber of architects actually stands behind it and says this is um, this is how much uh, you as clients need to pay your architects and that's not really up for negotiation yeah. The um, other thing that um, that we do here that uh, we don't do in Ireland is we do all the costing. Um, there is not really such thing as a quantity engineer, a uh, quantity surveyor, sorry, in Germany. There is an, in, in bigger offices, you would have a person fully dedicated to just doing costing all the time. Um, but in a small practice such as ours, we take on that role uh, and that liability. Um, mm-hmm. But it is, it's an interesting one because I mean, architects are definitely more and more marginalized in the building process. It comes, I think, also in part from the fact that we don't um, we don't like to do jobs that we're not into. Uh, so we're happier to give those jobs away or those roles away. And uh, for example, quantity surveying is not fun, but it um, but it's empowering. It's you you understand your building uh, to a greater extent. You have a, a better um, position at the negotiating table, you know what you're talking about. So, um, so actually, the client has to value the architect more in Germany because you're the one who knows how much the building will cost. Yeah, that's a very good point. Very good point. Um, I know a little bit about the Hawaii um, situation, and I know that the EU government mm. took Germany to the courts over it because of competition. Anyway, um, I, yeah. I, think, I think it's definitely something that should be explored more. Mm-hmm. Um, for all professions and uh, not just architectural professions but anyway we'll I'll leave that there we'll have that discussion another day so um so what's next for you jennifer what are your plans mm-hmm. in, the, in the coming months i know has covid held you back or are you yeah. coping with that you know what's what's going on just at the moment and into the future yeah we've definitely had um things laid on ice um which is uh which is sad we uh we were to have the opening of our first solo exhibition at the IAF um, uh, the day before yesterday, um, but that uh, oh. has obviously been, uh, we've postponed that for, I think, around a year in the end it'll be. So that was something that we were we were gearing up for and had done a lot of research uh, leading up to that is, uh, that we'll hopefully be able to open up again in the future. Um, 
and uh, there's a couple of other things. I have a, a, a fellowship at the Berlin Academy of Arts this year, which includes a residency on site, which I obviously can't go to at the moment. So there's, there's um, in terms of the kind of the academic side of the practice or the theoretical or the art side of the practice, there's a lot of those uh, projects which were uh, got to do with public funding or with a residency or um, yeah, with those kind of things that are um, more difficult now. Um, thankfully, the building projects are still going. Um, but yeah, where do we go in the future? We I think we have to learn to have a bit more of a work-life balance. We're very much still in this. Uh, in I mean, the practice is two years old, two and a half years old. So. Um, we're still very much figuring out what we are and what the balance is between this drawing practice and the and the building practice mm -hmm. uh, and teaching so that comes in as well and how we mirror uh, or how we balance those those three spinning plates um, mm -hmm. but uh, I mean the aim is to get bigger right the aim yeah. is to is to have bigger projects um, and also to let go a bit. I think we're also in that typical um, thing of a small practice where you learn to do everything and therefore want to do everything. Um, so it's is figuring it out. Hmm? Yeah. Is it just the two of you then in the practice? Yeah. Yeah. With collaborators, but our practice is just, it's just the two of us. So it's, we're in that phase of figuring out how do we, how do we expand? How do we let go and become maybe more people that organize and less the people who uh, save the PDFs and, and make the models. <laughs> so just a, just as kind of a, a final uh, question then, Jennifer, if, have you advice for young women architects in particular, or maybe some advice that you wish somebody had given you as a, as a graduate? Anything mm -hmm. that you want to share in that regard? Yeah, I, I think it's a funny thing. I think when you come out of university, uh, you're on a level playing field. I don't, uh, I think, I think I think young women architects should definitely see it that way that there there is not allowed to be any uh, discrepancy between uh, how a woman is treated and how a man is treated. It's just uh, that's just no go. Um, and that's I think the attitude one has to take that uh, there is no difference. Women make fantastic architects. I don't need to quote the statistics that come out of the universities. Everyone knows them. Um, mm -hmm. And we just need to own that and know that there is uh, there's nothing that we can do. I think the the issues of inequality happen further down the line. Actually, I think you want to take a young architect coming out of university into your practice if they're good, and it doesn't matter what gender they are. Um, it's that moment where where families start to come into play and where. Uh, a woman will have in Ireland four months off work, I think, and uh, a man will have two weeks. Yeah, <laughs> I don't. I don't need to go into detail about uh, about why uh, why that doesn't make sense. Uh, over here, you have you have shared paternity leave. The parents decide how they uh, balance it between each other, and and that's that. But that that is a fundamental part of of why that that balance goes completely off as you grow further up the ranks. Um, and that needs to be addressed sooner or later because the women architects that I see in high octane roles here in Berlin are phenomenal. <laughs> mm -hmm. And they just need the opportunity to be able to do that. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. We might leave it there on those words of wisdom and hopefully some people are listening and uh, to what you're saying in, in, in terms of that the whole thing of parental leave and, and, and balancing that play, level playing field for people. It is, you're right, it's, it's the, not the issue and it's an issue that we don't mm -hmm. discuss often enough. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Jennifer. That's been really, really interesting hearing about your life in Berlin and your practice indeed and, and well done to you and all good wishes for the future. Thank, thank you. you, Carol.